video games feature incredible graphics, transporting players into vibrant cities, epic battlegrounds and beautiful landscapes. But behind these visuals lies a sea of vertices, triangles and textures, working all together to craft immersive worlds that push the boundaries of reality. Ever marveled at the lifelike landscape and lighting fast action of your favorite games? It's not just simple 3D scene, it's a dynamic creation rendered at lighting speed faster than the blink of an eye. But how do we achieve such realism in real time? Let's learn how the graphic pipelines actually work. At the heart of video game graphics lies the rendering pipeline. A process composed of multiple steps, but let's first focus on the three essentials. Vertex shading, rasterization, and fragment shading. While the pipeline itself is a labyrinth of endless possibilities, these three serves as the cornerstone to all graphics applications. Meet the base of every 3D game that's ever created, the humble vertex. Born within the digital confinement of a 3D software and stored in a file, the vertex is soon to be a part of something greater, a living, dynamic, real-time world. But before our vertex can embark on this journey, it must navigate the realms of coordinate systems and transformations. From the XYZ axis of your model to the transformative power of matrices, each step brings the vertex closer to its destination. 3D games aren't really 3D, right? Because your screen is 2D, so it really just is an illusion. By taking our vertex through four main transformations, it becomes a part of the screen. A matrix is a coordinate system where we can store positions. We multiply a position from one grid to another grid to make that position into the other space. We do the inverse of this if we want to take it out of that. Our vertex first lives in the model space, so we need to take that into world space so that it follows along with the 3D model. Think of the vertex as a point on your skin. This vertex needs to be transformed when I move my arm around so therefore it needs to be multiplied by the R matrix. So therefore I need to multiply my vertex position with my R matrix. We then take the arm to our view, so our eye. If I move my eyes, the arm will move in the space of my eyes. There will be a bigger difference in angles if I'm here and if I'm here. So we need to multiply by the eyes. And that's view space or camera space. The inverse of the transformation of the camera. After that, we need to take the position in the view space, like an eye space, we need to take that into projection. So if we want to have a depth and we want to have a field of view, we need to multiply it by this matrix. And that matrix is called the projection matrix. This is the last step we need to do in the vertex shader. There is still one multiplication we need to do in order for the coordinates to actually happen to appear correctly on the screen. This is done automatically through the graphics pipeline in the rasterization stage. This stage is the perspective divide. We simply take the X, Y and Z coordinate of the position now translated into the projection space and we divide it by the W coordinate. This will make some magic math so that it has become perspective. Once these triangles are placed correctly on the screen, we need to know what pixels the actual triangle consists of because we have a triangle with three vertices, but what, what happens in between? And this is exactly what the rasterizer does. It interpolates between all these three vertices to get the rastered fragments so that we can then send these fragments to the pixel shader. Now the vertex has gone through all of the multiplications and now also the rasterizer, so it has become fragments in between and now we send these fragments to the pixel shader or the fragment shader in GLSL. In here the developer determines what should happen with the pixel or fragment. You could just output the color of the pixel here if you want, but normally what is done in this stage is at least some kind of light calculation. It is also here in the fragment slash pixel shader where all the cool programmable shader happens. These three are the main steps for the pipeline and is usually sufficient for most of the games. But this wouldn't be a complete video game rendering pipeline video if I didn't mention the other ones. First and foremost, it's pretty nice to break in all of the different rendering steps into fixed and programmable steps. Fixed state really means that we cannot change what happens in the state itself, 
we can just change the input and how it interprets the input. Programmable, on the other hand, means that we have totally control over what happens in that state, just as with vertex shader and pixel shader, where we can transform however we want and we can do whatever we want inside. We actually write the code ourselves, so that's a programmable state. Let's start with the input assembler. The input assembler groups together vertex data with certain input and output into primitives, which it then forwards to vertex shaders. It groups the vertices into different geometric types, such as lines, strips, points, and triangles. This step is crucial, for example, with triangles to know if you render a back face or a front face. The last thing it does is that it associates the assembled vertex data with the semantic you have put in your vertex shader. Then we have the vertex shader, but this step we've already went through, so let's jump to the next one. Now we have three different components that together make up kind of one step in the rendering pipeline, and this is tessellation. The first step of the three is the hull shader. This is a programmable state and it determines how much tessellation we want on the different patches. The next step is the tessellator itself. The tessellator subdivides the input primitives into different patches based on what you put into the how-to state. This is a hardware component and is a fixed component on the GPU. The last step of the tessellation is the domain shader. This is also known as the evaluation shader of the tessellation. It takes the output of the tessellator, which has the tessellated vertices and the control points, and computes the final position of each vertex. So the tessellation stage mainly just focuses on refinement and subdivision. The geometry shader operates on geometric data. An example of this is particles, where you can send one vertex to the shader, and then it can create a sphere, or a cube, or a predefined geometric shape just from this one vertex. Now we have the rasterizer, which we have also went through. And the pixel shader, which again, we have also went through. The last step of the whole rendering pipeline is the output merger. The output merger combines the output of the pixel shader or fragment shader with the render target specified using specified instructions. These instructions consist of blend state which controls alpha blending and additive blending and all the kind of blending you want between the render target and the output of the pixel shader. And there is one more in the rendering pipeline but it's kind of a different part of the rendering pipeline but it's still like in the pipeline right so it's not in the graphical pipeline but it's in the computational pipeline and you maybe know what i'm talking about but this is the compute shader this step really wasn't its own step before dx11 but got introduced because smart people and graphics engineers used the gpu pipeline for computational things which wasn't really the sole purpose of gpus in the first place but because it was so good at matrix multiplication people used it for computational power just like threading on the cpu unlike the previous systems or pipeline the compute shader doesn't work at all with like primitives and vertices it works on raw data inputted from the user but it's also a different side from the rendering queue. It has its own queue called the computational queue. This is why when performing rendering and then swapping to computational things and then swapping back to rendering, you get a swap between these queues. And this is called a context switch. This is something that's implicitly done in DX11, but in Vulkan and DX12 and lower level APIs, you can actually explicitly call the switch and you can do them threaded also. So if you want, you can actually schedule the queues at the same time, as long as they don't interfere with each other. The rendering pipeline has a lot of math intensive calculations. And without some knowledge of matrices and linear algebra, it can be really hard to understand. Therefore, I strongly encourage you to watch this next video, which helps you find your drive, effort and satisfaction with learning maths again. I'll see you there.